Hey, hello everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this Wednesday night Bible study for the Church of the Eternally Secure. Wow, it's been a strange night so far. Uh, we already started this program about 15 minutes ago, but uh, we had a technical mistake that, that was made, so we were streaming it on Matthias's channel. So we're starting all over right now, as, as though that never happened. And uh, everybody in the chat room, I guess you didn't even weren't even aware of it. So we're going to start from the beginning. Uh, uh, everybody in the chat room, welcome. Uh, if you're here for the first time, I especially want to welcome you. Uh, I hope you enjoy the program, and maybe you'll want to join us every Wednesday, Friday, and Sunday for our regular programs. Uh, now uh, we're going to study First uh, Corinthians. Uh, uh, chapter 6 for beginning with verse 1 tonight before we do though let me ask our brother Cripps and sister Renee just to say hi to everybody starting with the untwisted sister hey guys uh, I'm Renee Roland channel of the same name uh, I contend for the faith once delivered to the Saints as do all the brethren on here but uh, Luke gives me that loving term of endearment the untwisted sister because I like to untwist verses that uh, false teachers use to twist out of context to make you think that works are required or some kind of performance based salvation uh, that your works are necessary to either get maintain or prove your salvation uh, we we believe in getting people born again into the body of Christ first and then we deal with behavior after that because God's going to begin a work and whoever the Holy Spirit dwells with them so that's what we do. That is the specialty of my channel. It's evangelistic. Soteriology is what I uh, normally discuss. And but we we like to learn in context, and because everything is good news to anybody trusting in Christ. Also, I want to say that my son's aunt Brooke is here with us. She's off camera, but she's studying. She'll be in the chat room, and uh, she's going to actively be involved here. So. Um, Welcome her, please. Thank you, guys. Okay, thank you, sister. Uh, a couple of people in the chat room are saying there's uh, some noise problems. Uh, I had my fan on, I turned it off, uh, but uh, but they think it's your microphone, Renee. Uh, so, uh, let, uh, chat room, let us know. Uh, Renee, go ahead and talk for a second, uh, just, just as a test, uh, and then let us know if Renee ha is the problem or if it was my fan. Okay, I took my computer was on top of some books. Maybe that was doing it. Uh, is that is that better? Yeah. Okay. It sounds better now. No no complaints. So what I'll do is if I have to turn my fan on, I will just uh, mute my microphone so you, nobody will hear it. All right, Brother Cripps, who are you and what are you doing here? <laughs> my name is Jason Cripps, and uh, what I'm doing here is uh, amplifying his word with uh, two wonderful people that are uh, attempting to do the same thing and see what God has for us in it and sharing it with the chat. Uh, I have a channel. I'm part of a channel called True Story Live, which comes on Sunday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And uh, also on this channel, obviously, um, and on uh, Talking Doctrine on Mondays for uh, a broadcast called Monday's Milk. Hi, and um, I look forward to these every week, and um, I hope it's going to be edifying. And uh, hello to the chat. Good to see you guys. All right. Thank you, brother. All right. With no further delay, let's okay. get started uh, with uh, 1 Corinthians thank you. chapter Six. Renee, we're gonna get guys. we're gonna get started. We're having all kinds. It's like the first time we've ever done this tonight. <laughs> we, I've only done like five or six hundred of these. <laughs> it's like worse than the first time. Is my audio uh, okay though? Can everybody? Uh, hear all right? Yeah, they they said it's okay. I just put my fan on the floor because uh, Paula said she heard a hum again when I turned my fan. On. I don't know how she could hear the hum when I I had my microphone muted, uh, but uh, I don't know how what the problem was. But okay, let's get into the scriptures, the Word of God, the truth, and let's go to First Corinthians chapter six, verse one. Uh, Matthias, are you going to be able to uh, post them? Are you doing that? Let me see. Where is it, producer? 
Oh, yeah, he's got it up there for us. Thanks. Okay. In the KJV, chapter 6, verse 1 reads, Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? Verse 2. Do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Sister Renee, verse one and two. Yeah, this sets up the entire context. And unfortunately, this chapter is one of the worst twisted chapters in all the Pauline epistles. Uh, so <clears throat> what he's doing here is he is rebuking them for suing each other. Members of the church are suing each other. And not only that, they are taking these cases to be judged by the unbelievers. That's why it says, dare any of you, dare any of you having a matter against one another. First of all, you shouldn't be suing each other. If you have a disagreement, you should work it out. And if somebody gets over on you, just let them. Uh, dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unjust? There's the key. This little phrase sets up the entire context of don't you know the unrighteous won't inherit. Go to law before the unjust and not before the saints. Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? If the world should be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? It's saying you are going to be judging the world. You're going to be joint heirs with Christ, but you can't judge these tiny matters of bickering between you in the church. And now you're taking these matters, what's worse, before unjust people. They're unbelievers. They don't, they're, they're unjust. They don't, you know, you shouldn't be taking them before unbelievers, trusting them with your uh, lawsuits. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm going to read those two verses in the Amplified, Brother Cripps, before you respond. Okay. Uh, verse 1 and 2 in the Amplified reads, Does any of you, when he has a complaint, that is a civil dispute with another believer, dare to go to law? before unrighteous men, non-believers, instead of placing the issue before the saints, that is God's people? Do you not know that the saints, God's people, will one day judge the world? If the world is to be judged by you, are ye not competent to try trivial, insignificant, petty cases? <laughs> Yeah, it seems like it almost seems like if Paul had some kind of uh, uh, pre knowledge of of the the way that the uh, disputes that go on now between all these warring factions that are supposed to be in the body of Christ would would go on. Um, but it but he's talking specifically about go, taking the the matters that you could easily handle yourself between each other. You should be able to. Uh, and, and taking it you know, in front of the world, taking it to the courts and whatnot. And um, I don't know what it's like in the rest of the world, but at least in America, I mean, it's a litigious uh, uh, nation. I mean, people dragging other people into court over all kinds of things. And um, I, I grew up hearing that uh, that believers shouldn't shouldn't be taking other people to court. I mean, we just shouldn't do it. And I and uh, I I wonder if it's based on this scripture right here is where they get the idea for that. I mean, I never looked into it, but it seems like that's what he's saying. And it seems like he's also saying just work out these matters uh, matters between uh, between yourselves rather than take it to the world. Um, also, I think it's fascinating this idea of judging the world. Um, I'd like to know more about that. I mean, I know that uh, in his kingdom. Um, we're, we're going to have, uh, places of, uh, you know, rulership, join heirs with Christ. We're going to have, uh, many of us will have, um, uh, places of, uh, power and rural cities and things like that. Um, but we're ruling over the unjust. 
So uh, maybe one of you can comment on that and bring more light to that part as well, if you want to. Well, I'd like to look at the footnotes and then we can talk about that. Let's go to the uh, amplified version footnotes here. Uh, uh, it says on verse one and two, the footnotes are a property or civil claim not a criminal matter be, before it goes to court. All right, that didn't help much. And verse two, the amplified footnote says, this is the first of six, do you not know statements in this chapter? Brother Cripps, you probably would have uh, recognized that and reported it to us, the way you were able to identify Jesus, 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 Jesus in chapter five. Was that, was that chapter five or was, no, that was some other chapter. That was amazing. Uh, so let's look for that. Let's keep that in mind. Do you not know? Do you not know? Uh, yeah. Six times it says. Now let's look at the footnotes in the um, NABRE. Let's read the NABRE first. Um, it, it, it phrases it a little bit differently. Uh, verse 1 and 2 in the NABRE says, How can any one of you with a case against another dare to bring it to the unjust for judgment? instead of to the holy ones. Do you not know that the holy ones will judge the world? If the world is to be judged by you, are you unqualified for the lowest law courts? <laughs> uh, all right, I think that we understand what it means. Let's see if they have any uh, helpful notes in the footnotes on the NABRE. Uh, here's uh, one that says through one through verse 11, kind of an overview on verses one through 11. This is what we can expect as we go forward. It says, Christians at Corinth are suing one another before pagan judgments in Roman courts, a barrage of rhetorical questions, uh, 1 Corinthians 6 verses one through nine, betrays Paul's indignation over this practice, which he sees as an infringement upon the holiness of the Christian community. And then uh, verses two and three, the footnote reads, the principle to which Paul appeals is an eschatological prerogative. Um, eschatological um, it refers to the study of end times. Um, so it's an eschatological prerogative promised to Christians. They are to share with Christ the judgment of the world. That's in Deuteronomy 7 verse 22 and verse 27. Hence, they ought to be able to settle minor disputes within the community. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't know either. Uh, maybe Renee Moore's more or Matthias knows more about this, about this judgment of the world. How, how, what kind of involvement are we going to do? You know, the Lord doesn't really need us to judge. God's can judge so much better than us. But uh, is, Renee, do you have any thoughts on how any yeah. more information on that? Well, it says that we are joint heirs with Christ. We rule and reign with Christ. Uh, the apostles, uh, they judge and lead the 12 tribes of Israel. So that's who they're specifically given, uh, you know, leadership over. Uh, judging angels, I believe that the Lord is going to allow us to make decisions or participate in what happens to the fallen angels based on what they have done against God and to humanity. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, then let's go, let's go forward to uh, back to the KJV and look at the uh, verse three and maybe four. Let's see. It says KJV verse three says, know ye not that we shall judge angels. How much more things that pertain to this life? You know, well, let me read uh, verse four. If then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. Okay. Brother Cripps, you want to go first on this? Verse three and four. Uh, okay, so I understand the first part. Know you not that we shall judge angels? I, I've uh, uh, looked at that, and I understand that that part. Um, and also, uh, Renee made that clear. So, how much more things that pertain to this life 
Uh, if then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. Um, I'll read verse four in the Amplified. Maybe okay. uh, verse four in the Amplified says, so if you have lawsuits dealing with matters of this life, are you appointing those as judges to hear disputes who are of no account in the church? Oh, that amplifies it pretty good. <laughs> that amplifies it very well. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so that's making clear. So basically he's making the same point as he made in the other two verses. Is, uh, handle these disputes among yourselves. Don't go to the world. The world is uh, lower account, and they're not even part of the church to begin with. So he's he's saying basically the the, the idea of keeping things in house, you know, hand, handling it in house rather than uh, going outside of ourselves in order to have uh, a dispute heard. Mm -hmm. that, that's pretty clear. Mm -hmm. Okay, Renee, verses three and four. What do you say? Yeah, I think what we were just talking about. Um, it's it's in that context that I believe we're going to be judging the fallen ones based once we see uh, the damn what they have done against God because it even says some of the things they did they did to provoke the Lord uh, so they did it on purpose to him um, and also the damage that has occurred to the human race uh, because of their actions. Um, and then it says, but if you have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge to least esteemed in the church. He's saying uh, that even the, 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 the least in the church should be able to judge something like this. That, that it shouldn't be difficult. Or it, it should not. The, the one that you would trust least within the fellowship should be able to handle something like uh, dealing with uh, a lawsuit between two believers. Okay. Um, I'm, uh, I've made, admitted this many times, and I, I hope that we can all admit this. Um, I am not omniscient, and I am infallible. Oh, I'm sorry. I am fallible. <laughs> <laughs> I hope nobody takes a clip of that and uses it against me. <laughs> oh, they will. But I think you laugh too soon. They'd have to really, really get a good cut on that. <laughs> so, okay, I'm fallible. That means I'm not perfect. I make mistakes. And also, I don't, I'm not omniscient. I don't know everything. There's many things in the Bible I don't understand, many verses I'm pu that puzzle me. I'm doing the best I can. Uh, I'm still studying every day, but... Um, I, uh, there are some things where the Bible is either nothing said or something very little said. And this is one of those things, I think, uh, unless someone can point out to me more that uh, we can find other places, uh, but I think that probably would have been cited in the footnotes that we've been looking at if that was the case. But what we can conclude to the, from this is that we, we believers, uh, maybe maybe because we are, uh, when we have a glorified body, maybe we'll be able to think much, much better and we'll be more qualified. But just oh, yeah. think of it. We, unbelie we believers, <laughs> we believers are going to be judging the world somehow with Christ. And we're going to even judge the angels. That is mind boggling to me. It's mind boggling me for two reasons. God doesn't need us. He's capable without us. How are we going to, what kind of contribution can we make? And, and, and then of course, the, the fact that uh, we, we are going to do it, we, we must be able to do it. And that is just very impressive that we were going to be uh, able to participate in that judgment. But uh, there is nothing else said. Now I know Matthias, uh, Matthias has a uh, very, very commonly, there'll be a, something that's mentioned and he'll kind of uh, try to put pieces together in the Bible and, and, and come up with some conclusions and, or theories. And it, I always find it very interesting, but uh, we, we obviously when we do that, we're just speculating, we're surmising, and it's fun to do. And maybe sometimes we're right, 
but uh, we, uh, we just have to admit, sometimes we don't have enough information and we have to be careful not to make, make too many conclusions and we don't certainly don't want to do eisegesis, do we? We don't no. want to put something into the scriptures that's not there. Please, no. Okay. Uh, all right then, let's, uh, let's go forward, unless either one of you want to say for any more about that before we go to verse five. Oh, okay. I also wanted to say I understand that angel just means messenger, and sometimes angels aren't supernatural spiritual beings. But in this case, I believe they are referring to the supernatural spiritual messengers as angels. We will judge angels one day. I don't believe it's talking just about the messengers of God, yeah. like human messengers. I think it is a spiritual entity. Yeah, that's a good point. That's that's a I think a good conclusion. Also, in this case, it's not talking about angelic beings. Uh, I mean, it is talking about God. Three times now, I, I, so the opposite I things come out of my mouth or something. I what? told you your brain's like a sponge, but you wrung it out. <laughs> you know, I I was talking to someone the other day about this. That uh, oh yeah, Sister Paula. I was telling her because I guess last one of the recent pro programs. Uh, I either said something opposite of what I intended or people misunderstood me. I don't know, but but I know that many times that uh, I've actually said the opposite thing that I intended to say. And right now, tonight, three times already, I said the exact opposite of what I wanted to say. So, Lord, help me. Help me with this, will you? Uh, okay, so I think your, your position's correct. It, it, uh, sometimes uh, when it says... Uh, angel, it's referring to a messenger. In fact, I'm an angel. Uh, did you know that, Brother Cripps? You're an angel. You're a messenger. Yeah, I'm a messenger. Yeah. Uh, Sister Renee is uh, is uh, an angel. Um, we call her an evangelist. Um, evangelist. The middle of the word is angel. That means messenger, and the prefix Eve means a uh, good, uh, and so it's good message. And ist means one who's doing it. So you are one who is bringing a good message, an evangelist. Um, so a lot of times when it says, like I think in uh, the book of Revelation, when it talks about angels, it's not talking about angelic beings. But you've got to try to discern from the co context, uh, is this an angelic being or a, a messenger? And I think your conclusion is correct in this case. It is not angelic beings. Oh, it is. <laughs> I did it again. I give up. I oh, give up. Reset. Get a reset. I've said the opposite of what I meant. Okay. Yep, deleted. Deleted. Yeah. All right. Um, and now something else I was going to go into. Uh, oh, yeah. Okay. These angelic beings, um, there's, a, there's some content in the Bible telling us about the angelic beings. And now I'm probably going to get some people... Uh, question what I'm saying and 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 maybe say you're going too far. That's not in the canon. But we get a lot of information about angelic beings in the book of Enoch, in First Enoch. I found it very interesting. It goes into great descriptions and names and describes a lot of angels and a lot of angelic activities, what they were doing. And uh, but in the Bible, I think we only have two angels named right uh, we have gabriel and michael but uh, there's much more to be learned about angels from the book of enoch uh, i'm not promoting it as the word of god but personally i i like it very much okay anything else before we go to the next verse nope okay back to the kjv verse five i speak to your shame is it so that there is not a wise man among you? No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren? Verse 6. But brother goeth to law with brother, and that before the unbelievers. Sounds pretty disgusted to me, Sister Renee. Yeah, it's like you, you guys can't find one person that's worthy to judge this matter fairly within the church. And on top of the fact that you're suing each other, which should be a last resort if ever, and if they do defraud you, just take it, turn the other cheek, right? Yeah. Um, 
then it says, uh, but worse than that, you're taking your cases to unjust unbelievers. You're taking it outside the church. That's why he says in the, the, the verse right before this, we just discussed the least esteemed you, uh, the least esteemed of you could handle this. There, I mean, the guy that the least trustworthy guy, the least spiritually mature guy should be able to handle this task. But you're saying nobody in the church is able to do this. You are forced to take it between uh, to unbelievers that have no spiritual wisdom. It says don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. But that's exactly what they're doing. It's, what is that? Proverbs, uh, Luke, Crips? Yeah, to walk in the council of the ungodly or something like that. I bet Matthias knows too. One of them, I don't know which one, but you know what I'm saying. That's exactly what they're doing. Yep. All right, thank you, Brother Cripps. I'm going to read verse five and six in the Amplified. It says, "I say this to your shame. Can it be that there is not one wise man among you who is governed by integrity?" and will be able and competent to de decide private disputes between his fellow believers. But instead, brother goes to law against brother, and that before judges who are unbelievers. Yeah, he's pretty upset, and, and, and uh, understandably so. Um, uh, pretty strong words. Uh, saying, I say this to your shame. Be, you should be ashamed. It's like we say today, you should be ashamed of yourself. I mean, really? You can't find one guy to handle this uh, amongst you, really? Uh, come on. Um, uh, yeah, so, uh, and then the sarcasm in the other one, I mean, because he uh, in the Amplified, of course, they use a, a question mark, but in, in the King James, there's no question mark. Um, I realize the Amplified is, is putting it the way that it, uh, it's supposed to be understood. But he's not saying it in the form of a question. He's saying brother goes against brother uh, and that before judges who are unbelievers. Um, so this has obviously happened. And he's uh, he, he's just, he's upset. He's upset and he's, he's saying you guys needed to work this out between you rather than uh, taking it to uh, people that aren't even in the church. They're not even in the same body. Um, and uh, you shouldn't do this anymore. I mean, this shouldn't have ever happened. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, well, you know, last Wednesday we did Chapter 5. And um, here's the amazing thing about the Bible that is, makes it so, so wonderful. Just every reading in the Bible is, is, is a new experience. No matter how many times we read it, each new time, there's like new revelations. It's, that's why it's so exciting. But it's not like I've never read 1 Corinthians chapter 5 before. Right. But last week, it had a particularly powerful meaning and effect on me. And it, and it, it motivated me and, and uh, um, prompted me to actually take some action based upon what it was telling us we have to do. And that is, uh, we, we cannot to tolerate railers. Uh, and, you know, there's other things too, but what stood out to me were railers and, and that uh, they have to be disfellowshipped. And um, now I, I, I've confessed before, and I'll say again, I am very weak in this area. Um, I've, it's not that I don't recognize bad things in people that need to be addressed is just that confronting them and then disciplining them uh, is uh, something that's very hard for me to do. Uh, and yet, as I read this again tonight, it's like shaming me. That's what it says. I speak to your shame and mm -hmm. I'm, I feel shame. I feel shame that, that uh, I ha have not, uh, uh, been too weak uh, to confront certain things, right? And so I'm I'm determined to do better in that respect now. Um, all right, any more on this? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to mention. Darlene uh, asked, uh, "Are are we going to judge 
only the fallen angels. And I'd like to say this is just speculation, okay? Just speculation. But I've always assumed it was just the fallen ones. But who knows? Maybe God does allow us to judge the angels if they get promotions or rewards or something. I don't know. I don't know. But that's just speculation. Uh, so I, my assumption is he's talking about the angels that fell, I, I think, but I mean, we can't exclude it. It just doesn't say if we also judge the, the ones because they're under God's service. I, I don't know if we would even have a need mm -hmm. to judge them. So yeah. just the idea. Well, uh, this is the word of God. I believe it, but, uh, the whole idea of me being, put in a position to judge angels, judge the world, judge the lost, and also judge the angels. I would think that it's probably only fallen angels, but it doesn't say, so I don't know. But just the, I, I, I'm in awe of that. Um, you know, what's interesting, and it just popped into my head, isn't this what uh, one of the things that, that uh, Lucifer was upset about, of God setting uh, what, who he considered to be lower than himself? you know, humans in charge and giving them dominion over the earth in the beginning. Um, he was pretty upset about that. There's some uh, apocryphal books that yeah. go into detail that yeah. uh, some of them, I believe it could be true. And then some of them take it really far and claim right. God forced them to worship man. And I don't believe that because right, right, right. God receives worship. Right. So right. yeah, it sounds like that he was, I think he just got busted for trying to be God himself. And, and, uh, and like you said, probably got mad that he gave man uh, a dominion over the earth. And also that God himself was going to come in the form of a man. Yeah. You know, that makes total sense. But it seems like with his pride and his arrogance, he wouldn't think too highly of being, being in a place of even potentially being judged somehow by a feeble man, for sure. Maybe that is since we're gonna since as he is, so are we in the war in this world. You know, all of our flaws and stuff are gonna be uh, gone, and yeah. and that maybe the fact that man does judge him is part of the judgment. Yeah, interesting. Hmm. Yeah. Um. Okay, uh, let's let's go uh, back to the KJV, uh, uh, verse seven. Now, therefore, there is utterly a fault among you, because ye go to law one with another. Why do ye not rather take wrong? Why do ye not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Oh, wow. Brother Cripps? Wow, it sounds like he's saying what kind of what Renee was saying earlier is like yeah. rather than take each other to court, um, you know, turn the other cheek, you know, let it go. Uh, that last sentence, why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Um, I don't know what the Amplified says, but that's what it seems like he's saying to me. Um, you know, uh, okay, so now therefore there's utterly a fault among you because you go to the law, uh, go to the law one with another. Why do you, why do ye not rather take wrong? Just go ahead and accept it. Go ahead and accept the wrong that was done if you can't work it out between yourselves rather than taking it to the courts who are not even in the body. That's what I think. Mm-hmm. All right, let, I'm going to read verse 7 in the Amplified for Rene. Uh, why, the, the very fact that you have lawsuits with one another is already a defeat. Mm. Why not rather be wronged? Mm. Why not rather be defrauded? Rene? Uh, yeah, he's, he's, he's saying here, Look, it, rather than trying to seek some kind of justice here, we're all sinners and we've all been forgiven the greatest debt anyone could ever owe. And because of that, we should be able to just accept that somebody got over on us. You know, just it's fine. They got over on you. It wasn't just it was terrible. Forgive your brother and move on. Be an example. Literally turn the other cheek here. 
because it says, uh, now therefore there is utterly a fault among you because you go to law one with another. Why do you not rather take the wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourself, suffer or allow uh, someone to go ahead and get one over on you? So what? They got something. They, they, it's probably monetary. It sounds like it's monetary uh, because that there's the defrauding. So I, I think uh, somebody financially uh, did something either dishonest or owes someone financially. And he's saying, just forgive this financial debt. You've been forgiven your sin debt. You shouldn't be suing each other. We, you know, it's just, it's not, that's not a good example. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Paul is saying that uh, one option is for you to go to court to the, uh, rather than uh, having it decided in the church. Uh, and, and that's, he's saying, you should not be doing that. Another option is for you to just drop it and accept the fact that they ripped you off or, you know, stole from you or defrauded you or whatever. Just, just accept it and let it go, forgive it and move on. And, uh, uh, I, I, I'm getting the impression he's saying that that is the better of these two options. It would be better to just to accept that you got wrong and just forget it and, and forgive and forget rather than uh, try to pursue it in, in, a, in a secular court. Uh, let's look at the next verse, uh, same thing in the, in the KJV. It says, um, verse 8, Nay, ye do wrong and defraud, and that your brethren. And Crips, I'm going to read it next, also in the Amplified while I'm at it here. It says, on the contrary, it is you who wrong and defraud, and you do this even to your brothers and sisters. Yeah, I think it's clear. I think it's clear that's what he's saying. Um, what we talked about uh, a few minutes ago, the very fact that you have lawsuits one another is already defeat. I, I love that sentence. <laughs> Why the very fact that you have lawsuits with one another is already, you, you've already lost. Um, so why not just go ahead and let let it be wrong um could be financial either way though he it seems like he's saying rather again rather than take it to uh the roman courts um why not just let it go if again if you can't work it out between yourselves because that's how he starts out uh chapter six he starts out to like keep it in house work it out between you but if you can't uh don't take it to the 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 considerably the lower courts and then now in verse seven in verse eight, he's saying, "Like, why not just? Why not just look? If you're defrauded, you're you're defrauded." I like what Renee said. You've been forgiven this great debt, um, and 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 how true is that? And we've all been forgiven such a great debt. Uh, we should be willing to forgive, especially in the body. We should be willing to forgive other people that uh, defraud us in some way, ra rather than taking it to court. Okay, I'm going to look at it in the NABRE verse eight. Instead, you inflict injustice and cheat, and this to brothers. Well, again, a lot of this is really hitting home to me. Um, I, I, this may sound uh, wrong, uh, self-righteous. Uh, um, look, uh, I'm not without sin still. My sins are paid for. But my walk uh, is not perfect. I admit that. And I, I can tell you the things that I still do that I regret and that I, I'm praying that the Lord will help me to change. But then there are some things that I are un unthinkable to me, for me personally. And yet, Paul is saying to this congregation, and I also say, not to this congregation, but, but many professing Christians that I've known, that uh, you think that you could expect better from them. And yet he's saying, the, you're actually, uh, um, says you are um, inflicting injustice and cheating your, the brethren. So they're being unjust and cheating. Now I could go on with another list 
Paul has a list coming up, but I could make my own list of, of things where I've observed professing Christians. I'm, I'm serious. I, this, it breaks my heart that so many professing Christians I know, they, they have been the most evil, hateful people I've ever encountered in my life. And they name Jesus. And if you ask them uh, these diagnostic questions I, I keep bringing up, are you certain you're gonna go to heaven? And if so, why? And they can give me the right answer. And I expect better from someone like that. And yet I'm not challenging their salvation. I can't say. They say the right thing, but their behavior is some of the worst behavior I've ever seen in my life. Uh, for 11 years now on YouTube, I've seen this over and over and over again, the kind of things that have, uh, I've seen done to me and others that are just I've never been treated like that by uh, the, the world, by the, the secular world, by the, law, the unsaved people. They seem to have better character, better morals, better uh, 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 code uh, uh, than, than uh, many of the people we know who name Jesus. And so uh, it's not just a problem now. Look, I, mean, I, I keep saying this over and over again. Every problem we see in the church today, we see recorded in these epistles. There's nothing new under the sun. Um, all right. Uh, any more on that before we go to the verse? Uh, yeah, I, I'd love to add one more thing. And that's that we've talked about this before. When when Paul keeps repeating the same thing, keeps pounding home the same thing over and over and over again, I've said that they had the same problem back then that we have now. It's almost as if God knew that this would be a continual problem even 2,000 years later, roughly. I mean, I'm not being exact there, but roughly 2,000 years later. And we're still dealing with the same issues that Paul had to deal with, the same frustrations, the same stuff that should be not should not be happening. Um, I like the way you put it, Luke, that they confess Christ or they they say that they're of him. But when you look at their behavior, the, the fruit stinks. It just really does. So we're left to make a determination. Are these people even saved? And I, I don't I don't want to put myself in that position and having to decide that. Um, these people that Paul's talking about are obviously saved. Otherwise, he he wouldn't he wouldn't put himself into place to correct them in the first place. So they're acting in a way that's unbecoming of a believer. And and your example of things of that happening now is right on. I mean, gosh, we could throw a stone and hit a situation where this stuff is going on right now. Um, I don't want any part of it. I I, I want to act the way that that's befitting. Uh, someone that confesses Christ and someone that calls himself a believer. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, we're able to do that if we submit ourselves to that. But I think a lot of these people, I mean, it comes down to pride. I mean, that's just my opinion, but it's, but it's their own pride that gets in the way and it causes so many problems. I don't want to be in that place. Yeah, uh, but thankfully, Paul gives us very clear instructions in the last chapter about how we are to deal with this, these people. Uh, and he says, if they're an unbeliever, we're not to judge them. But if someone claims faith in Jesus, and, and, and I think that we discussed it last time, and I'm on the impression that, that they, uh, they, they name Christ, they're identifying themselves as Christ, but we don't know. But if they identify themselves as a Christian, Okay, we'll take your word for it. If you are a Christian, you have to behave better. Otherwise, we have to disfellowship you. So there's the there's the uh, protocol. Uh, Renee, any more before I go to the next verse? No, I just want to remind everyone that what we, and I was thinking, uh, Jason, pride is a big underlying thing in this chapter. We've I mean, seen a lot in the whole uh, book so far, and you, you've caught that. Uh, but I want to remind everybody the context and what we have discussed up until this point builds the actual understanding of this next verse that is so misused. We've all done videos on this verse to prove its context. And even though we've done this, people will still refuse to hear what it actually means. Uh, so uh, when we get, you know, the unrighteous, I, I want to 
You seem quite eager to talk about the verse, so I'll, I'll, I'll read it now. Verse 9 in the KJV is, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. I'm going to read verse 11 because that's the context you have to have, Renee, as you know. And such were some of you. Ah, uh, they leave that out. <laughs> leave it out? No, they always leave that out. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, and such were some of you, but ye are washed, ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So you got 9, 10, and 11, Renee. Uh, you had to put that, join them together. Brother Jason uh, is the one that keeps pointing out they never give you the good news after what appears to be the bad. But this isn't even bad news. It has nothing to do with us. And I tell people, the unrighteous here are not the brethren. The unrighteous he's talking about, they are not believers. They are the same people he's referring to that he is rebuking the church for taking their court cases before. Yes. So the unjust that are mentioned in, chat, in the, the first or second verse are the same unrighteous that he's mentioning in this verse. Yep. And the reason he says that is, it, it, and they will argue with me saying that this is the believers. No, it's not. We're the righteousness of God in Christ. He's saying that, why do you take your cases? You shouldn't be suing each other, but if you are, why are you taking them before an unjust person outside the body of Christ? Don't you know you're going to judge angels one day and the unrighteous won't judge angels. They don't inherit the kingdom. So if God has found you worthy to judge angels one day, why can't you find yourselves worthy to judge within the church? Don't you know the unrighteous won't inherit the kingdom? And then he says, and you know, he gives this list of sin of what these unrighteous, unjust unbelievers do. And he's reminding them, you're gonna trust these people with these attributes, uh, these qualities to judge within the church? Don't you know the unrighteous? And what are some of the qualities they have? Wow. Some of their qualities are this, the ones that won't inherit the lost unbelievers, fornicators. They're fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, effeminate, abusers of themselves with mankind, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, extortioners, they do all that. They're not going to inherit the kingdom, but yet you are deeming them worthy to judge the brethren. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And then uh, brother you were one of those, but you've been washed, justified, sanctified in the name of Jesus. So you're you're not the unrighteous anymore. So uh, with Ray Comfort, Kirk Cameron, John MacArthur, every one of them have used this verse out of context it says see if you do any of these sins that you're the unrighteous and you will not inherit the kingdom and i disagree with ges's interpretation which thinks that that means that the unrighteous believers won't inherit certain rewards it's not talking about believers at all nope it's talking about unbelievers nope you know mm -hmm. yeah okay brother cripps i'm going to read it in the amplified 9 10 and 11 I, real, I looked ahead, and I, I like how it's stated. So uh, 9, 10, 11, the Amplified reads, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit or have any share in the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate by perversion, nor those who participate in homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, whose, that is those whose words are used as weapons to abuse, insult, humiliate, intimidate, or slander. Wow. Uh, uh, I lost my place here. Uh, nor swindlers, nor, nor swindlers will inherit or have any share in the kingdom of God. 
and such were some of you before you believed. Yes. But you were washed by the atoning sacrifice of Christ. You were sanctified. That is, you were set apart for God and made holy. You were justified. That is, you were declared free of guilt in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit of our God, the source of the believer's new life and changed behavior. Amen. There's the good news, Renee. Verse 11, there's the good news. And and what she's getting so upset about is because they'll they'll take verse 9 and they'll read that and they'll say, yep, yeah, see, if someone's drinking or if someone's a homosexual or if someone's uh, greedy or if they're a reviler or any of that, then they're not saved. They're not going to heaven. These people, verse 11, clears the whole thing up. And such were some of you. And then in the Amplified, it puts in brackets before you believe. That, that's what, oh, I didn't see that. That's good. That's good. At least they're admitting that's not even talking about the brethren. But you know what else sticks out just now? Is that the word extortioners in there. You're going to let them judge the cases and they'll probably ask for a bribe. Oh, yeah. You oh, know? Yeah. They never give the good news. Every single one of those uh, preachers that I mentioned have used this verse to say exactly what you said they say, Jason. Yeah, it doesn't fill the, it doesn't yeah. fill their pockets. It doesn't make sense at all. That no. context of that verse like that, how can we be the unrighteous? We're not, our righteousness isn't based on us not being revilers, not being extortioners, but whether we have the blood of Christ that's cleansed us from that unrighteousness. That's right. Amen, brother. Before you before you believed, but ye were washed by the atoning sacrifice of Christ. You were sanctified, set apart for God, and made holy. You were justified. Going back to Romans 5, justified, declared free of guilt in the name of Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, Spirit of our God, the source of the believer's new life and changed behavior. Um, yeah, so uh, people cherry pick. This is the problem with cherry picking, as we've said before. Read it in the context of the whole chapter. And then also you have to look at the context of the whole book. And it, it, um, I think we've all said this at one time or another, but if something's confusing to you, read the ones, the, read the verses that are more clear. Read the chapters that are more clear uh, before you uh, develop your doctrine or start, especially before you start trying to tell other people, just focus on verse 9. Anyone that does these things, they're not going to heaven. It's not It's not what it says. You have to read it in context. Um so yeah, again, Paul bringing this point home, and I like how uh, Renee you uh, tied it back into the first verse. How that how they he starts out this whole thing by by uh, setting up the the context by which the whole letter should be read, of uh, like you know making the distinction between who we are as God's people and who the world is. And then in verse 9, then he's saying, hey, by the way, let's do some reminders of what the people in the world do. Let's let's remind you of, of, of some of the things you used to do before you were saved by God. It's so clear to me. So super clear. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm seeing that Hendrix is asking if I can define what a railer is. Um I, I think it was uh, pretty well explained in the um, uh, in in the Amplified. So I'll read it again in the Amplified. Uh, it says, um, uh, it, "It says nor revilers. A railer is a reviler, and it says those who whose words are used as weapons to abuse, insult, humiliate, intimidate, or slander." So that would be a reviler or a railer is the same thing. And you know what else they would be called since uh, like a railing accusation, they'd be called a devil. A reviler would be a devil, a person that accuses. Yeah, yeah. Now there is a footnote in the NABRE for uh, verse nine. So let me, and this might be helpful to understand something else. Uh, it says, uh, the Greek word translated as boy prostitutes 
may refer to catamites, such as boys uh, or young men who were kept for the purposes of prostitution, a practice not uncommon in the Greco-Roman world. In Greek mythology, this was the function of Ganymede, the, quote, cupbearer of the gods, unquote, whose Latin name was catamitis. The term translated sodomites refers to adult males who indulged in homosexual practices with such boys. See similar condemnations of such practices in Romans and 1 Timothy. Um, all right, well, that's just more information. Uh, but it, it, there, again, there are people that want to, uh, out of all this, li this list, and I asked last time, well, uh, do you think the list is complete? And I think we all thought it was complete, but I mean, not complete. I thought it was just an example list. Uh, there's more things that could be added to the list, but Matthias thinks it's a complete list, if I remember correctly. And uh, I, I'm, I don't think this would be a complete list. I think these are just a, a, a partial list of the things that could be uh, pointed out here. But uh, I just always uh, am um, amazed by, you can give a whole list, and the one thing that stands out to, to many people is those homosexuals. Yeah, yeah, they can't you know? any of the other things that they're guilty of, like lying yeah. or accusing yeah. or railing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, just the gay people. What they're doing is they're railing against the homosexuals. Yeah, that's exactly right. You got it, Brother Luke. Yeah. You got it. It's amazing to me, and I'm so glad you pointed out that hypocrisy. Jason the other night said that it's always a sin they don't personally struggle with. Yeah. That's the one that sticks out to them. And, or, and it's amazing because he's pointing out these people are actively doing this. This is how they live, and you're trusting them with these cases. Well, you're uh, in this particular case. Uh, I, it's just a theory, uh, but I suspect that they pr may actually struggle with this these homosexual desires, and they hate themselves because they have them. So therefore, they act out against homosexuals uh, oh, okay. i'm not saying that Closeted. i'm not saying that is the case but i think that is the case sometimes that's true well we used to have a saying uh if you spot it you got it if you hate it in someone else or you hate this usually because you have that same weakness yeah well there's a there's a, a, a phrase a, a word called gaydar it's like someone who can really recognize a gay person is you're very sensitive they can identify the gay people but then something that should be go along with that is hey it takes one to know one i mean how are how are you so familiar with every little nuance of a gay man uh well maybe maybe you you understand it real well for a particular reason Amen. Uh, i'm just speculating i think no. this is probably true in, in some cases I agree, uh, but some some other cases, it's just as we said, the uh, the sin of the father growing three or four generations. It's just that they were taught this bigotry and and prejudice, and it was passed down in the family line uh, of their a whole family line of bigots. Amen. And hater, brother Luke. All right, let's go to the back to the KJV on verse twelve. I'd like to say one thing. I don't know uh, right. any person that excludes one type of sinner from the blood atonement of Jesus and screams hatred and even execution for those sinners should not be running a church or leading anyone. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I've had several street preachers ask me, they say, look, you're not saying that a, a practicing homosexual can be saved, are you? I say, yes, that's what I'm saying. And why not? After all, aren't you a practicing sinner? I am I can see your sin right now. It's spiritual pride, self-righteousness. You know? Man. Why do they single that out and say, you're not saying, oh, so you're telling me a gay person, if they continue to be gay, can be saved without stopping? Uh, you don't stop all your sin. You haven't stopped all your sin. So why are you demanding this guy give up his? 
You have to stop there all your sin. You're absolutely right, Brother Luke. You say, well, you're a practicing sinner yourself. What do we What do we say one night, Brother Luke? We don't need practice. We're good at it. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Let's 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 go to the next verse in the KJV, verse 12. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. This is the verse uh, I'm, I'm really eager to get into because this is like the deal killer. Uh, the, this is one that spoils the Lordship heretics fun. It says, all things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Brother Cripps? Yeah, there you go. I like it too. So um, everything's everything's fine, uh, and this is Paul saying this. Everything's or everything's lawful for me. Uh, doesn't mean everything is good for me, but everything's lawful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. In other words, he's not going to have any addictions. He's not going to have anything ruling over him. He's not going to have any idols. He's not going to have anything that that uh, he's not allowing his uh, changed spirit to control and pummel um, his his uh, flesh that he has to walk around with. Of course, he's free of it now. But the, the same flesh that we have to walk around with, he's not going to allow anything to come out of that and make the decisions for him in his life. That's, the, that's what I take it to mean. Mm -hmm. Well... Uh, there's a in the in a, in the amplified uh, uh, between verse 11 and verse 12 it has a subtitle it says the body is the Lord's mm. uh, and uh, uh, the beginning also of uh, in the NABRE it has a subtitle beginning with verse 12 it says sexual immorality uh, so that's interesting because um, um, the interpretation of each of these verses uh, could be, what is he talking about? Everything is, is uh, lawful for me. Is it, is it what he's going to talk about next? Or is it what he just finished talking about? Or is it both? Uh, so Sister Renee, let me read it in verse 12 in the Amplified. Uh, and then uh, everything is permissible for me but not all things are beneficial. Everything is permissible for me. I will not be enslaved by anything and be brought under its power, allowing it to control me. So uh, it's going. he's gonna start talking about food in a minute, but then he was just finished talking about this laundry list of bad bad behavior. And so is, the, is verse 12 talking about the previous things or the following things or both, Renee? What do you think? Well, uh, yeah, I, th I think contextually where you were beginning to go with that uh, was interesting and would have been very controversial had we continued down that path. Um, uh, I think the actual, uh, I think you're absolutely right, but I also think that he's giving some examples here because he lists all this stuff these guys do, right? Like drunkards. Uh, and then uh, I don't want to go ahead, but it's talking about, you know, eating certain foods and stuff. And although uh, drinking actual wine is not forbidden, uh, but drunkenness is considered sinful. So uh, for instance, you know, earlier in the chapter, he talks about meat offered to idols and he goes, well, what's an idol? It's nothing. You know, all things, you, know, you can eat anything. You don't have to eat kosher, dietary laws. You can eat anything because everything's to be eaten as long as you thank the Lord for it in gratitude. Um, and so I think this specific thing is kind of geared toward things of the flesh like that. Like some things religious people get hung up on, like you can't eat this meat, you can't drink alcohol, you can't do this. And he's saying, well, you know, because he's just mentioned drunkenness, extortioners, homosexuality, all these things these lost people do. And he's he's also, I think he's confirming, yes, I, I'm not let I don't I'm not forced under bondage where I, I can't have a glass of wine or I can't eat certain mm -hmm. things. I, I can I, I'm free. I'm free to live my faith, but 
I'm not going to be brought under bondage. I think Jason's, the brother Jason says, well, I'm not going to be addicted. I'm not going to have it control me instead of the Holy Spirit guiding me because I don't want to be in the bondage of an addiction or a habit that, that actually leaves me rather than Christ and his spirit leading me. So um, when it says, let me find that. that yeah, because it does, it mentions covetous and drunkards and extortioners and such were some of you. And then he confirms all things are lawful for me, but not all things are expedient. So everything, I'm allowed to do everything, but not everything edifies or is good for me. So I use my common sense to what is one going to be good for me? Is it going to help me grow spiritually? And and also, what does it look like to others? How, how is that going to, is it going to lift up my brothers and sisters in Christ? Because it, he doesn't want anything to control him other than the spirit of Christ, I believe. And not to be caught up in things of the flesh. Remember, it says uh, those who are in the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. So they're going to get caught up and eat this, don't eat that, taste not, touch not, handle not. Because they're minding things of the flesh. And he's saying we're all free to make these choices. But we have to decide through common sense. Is it edifying to us? Is it edifying to others? Is it beneficial? Okay. Um, I've uh, I've never really tried to make this distinction if uh, verse 12 uh, is referencing what was just said or what uh, it follows it. Uh, I, I think that it probably applies to all of it. But um, particularly as we continue on, it talks about not only food, but uh, the uh, sexual immorality. And um, yeah. I, I would say that um, I, we have to ask ourselves, uh, now, I, I've said this many times, and most Christians don't realize that uh, the laws of Moses, the, there are 613 laws, uh, 10 of them were written by the finger of God in stone, uh, the rest were given to Moses to write down. So you got all these laws for Israel, but they were never given to the Gentile world. Uh, Paul says that we're under a different law, and that is the law of our conscience. Uh, our conscience tells us what right and wrong is. And after all, we inherited this from Adam and Eve when they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We know what's good. We know what's evil. Uh, so um, we don't need the uh, laws of Israel to, uh, to, to, to guide us. Um, but why do you think the Lord will say that, hey, don't fornicate? Don't commit adultery? And uh, on and on and on. But I'm going to focus on those two for a moment. But just... Is it because uh, God wants to like frustrate us and make life miserable? He gives you a, a powerful urge, a uh, desire for uh, sexual activity. Uh, and, and if that sexual need is not satisfied, then frank, all kinds of reactions, anger and frustration can build up. And, 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 and yet you're told not to do it. So what is God trying to do here? Is he trying to take away your fun and just make you frustrated and angry? And uh, especially a lot of the young Christian men that, that want to be faithful and not fornicate and, and be promiscuous outside of marriage or before a marriage. I, I say, no, God is not trying to frustrate us. He's not trying to spoil our fun because sex is fun. So well, why does he say, don't give you this, uh, this pleasure and tell you not to do it and he's saying that there is a proper uh, mode for you that this function is uh, to, to take place and that's within a marriage if it's done outside of a marriage then uh, you have consequences you have uh, uh, you have uh, sexually transmitted diseases you have uh, pregnancy out of out of wedlock you have if it's a, a adultery you, you can cause divorces and broken families there's all kinds of consequences so God is not saying don't fornicate don't commit adultery because he wants to make us frustrated and kill our fun uh, but he's saying for your own good do it within these parameters otherwise uh, you, you're going to cause all kinds of havoc it will, will result from it. All right. Uh, before I go on, any thoughts on all that? 
uh, I, I was saying amen to a lot of what you said. I just wanted to say what you said is actually bold and brave. Yeah. You know what I'm okay. Uh, all right. Uh, so let me read that. Uh, let me see. I'll, I'll go back to the KJV and to verse um, 13. Mm. Meats for the belly and the belly for meats. But God shall destroy both it and them. Now, the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. Okay, Renee, you want to go first on that one? I'll have to read it in the yeah. Amplified to make more yeah. sense of it. He's, uh, he's saying that, because he just said all things are lawful, and he's saying once again, that which is flesh is flesh. And those that are of the flesh, they mind the things of the flesh. Meat for the belly, belly for the meat. It's all flesh, 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 flesh. Has nothing to do with your spiritual state. Meat for the belly and belly for the meat. So it's nothing to do with spirit. It's all flesh. But God shall destroy both it and them. It's, it's, it perishes. It's not eternal. It's not spiritual. It's fleshly minded. Now, the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body, because we are not our own. We have been bought with a price. And so now because we're not ours, we should allow the Lord to control our bodies. They don't belong to us anymore. He's reminding them of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, Brother Cripps, I'll read these verses in the uh, Amplified. Awesome. Verse 13 in the Amplified is... Food is for the stomach, and the stomach for food. But God will not do away with both of I'm sorry. <laughs> but God will do away with both of them. The body is not intended for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. And the Lord is for the body. That is to save, sanctify, and raise it again because of the sacrifice of the cross. Amen. Yeah, um, I I think that uh, Renee hit on it uh, just fine, and uh, the comments comments made are are pretty clear by him. So, again, going back to verse twelve, he says everything's permissive. Says he's not going to be enslaved to anything. In other words, he's not going to allow. Uh, things of the flesh to control him. He's going to rely on the the Holy Spirit and uh, pummel his uh, flesh in, into shape. It doesn't say it in this verse, but it's referring to other other verses that he's uh, used before. And then in this one, you know, it's saying, yeah, the purpose of the food is for the stomach. The stomach is for food. Um, God's going to get rid of them both, do away with them both. Again, we're talking about the unjust. Uh, for us, the body's the oh, and the body's not intended for sexual immorality. Um, that's yeah, and that's not what it's intended for. He he mentions uh, the sex, sexual stuff in the verses above again, talking about the unjust. Um, so certainly, once we're uh, sanctified, we shouldn't be struggling with those things in the first place. So he's, I, I think he's kind of nodding at that uh, idea. Oh, everything's every uh, you know in verse twelve. Everything's permissible, but let's remember, you know, let's not get too carried away. Doesn't mean that we're supposed to, you know, walk around and be immoral. I like that Luke said. Uh, I think it was Luke that said the, the common sense. You know, use your common sense. No, that was Renee. Renee said common sense. Sorry. Um, you know, unfortunately, sense doesn't seem common anymore. It just seems seems like things are. Ah, amen to that, brother. Yeah, it seems like that. Um, but guess what? We don't need common sense if we have the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is in the process. We're all in the process of having our spirit conformed to the likeness of Christ day after day after day. He's making us into uh, a wonderful creation. Um, and then when we have our eternal bodies, we'll no longer have to struggle with all this stuff in the first place. Uh, but for now, uh, I think Paul's making the point that everything's permissible, but let's not get carried away. Um, I like the way they amplified, lastly, just to say, I like the way they amplify says at the end, uh, the purpose to save, sanctify, and raise it again because of the sacrifice of the cross. 
again, without what Christ did, we would we would have the same result as the unjust. So no one has to uh, be in that unjust state. We can be justified um, by accepting the the free gift. Simply, mm-hmm. uh, there is a footnote on the NABRE for verse uh, twelve through twenty. Uh, so uh, let's look at that NABRE footnote twelve through twenty says. Paul now turns to the opinion of some Corinthians that sexuality is a morally indifferent area. This leads him to explain the mutual relation between the Lord Jesus and our bodies in a densely packed paragraph that contains elements of a profound theology of sexuality. Um, Now, also the footnote on verse 12 and 13 It says, everything is lawful for me. The Corinthians may have derived this slogan from Paul's preaching about Christian freedom, but they mean something different by it. They consider sexual satisfaction as a a matter as indifferent as food, and they attribute no lasting significance to bodily functions. Paul begins to deal with the slogan by two qualifications, which suggest principles for judging sexual activity. Not everything is beneficial. Uh, On the finality of freedom and moral activity, not let myself be dominated. Certain apparently, uh, apparently free actions may involve in fact, a secret servitude in conflict with the Lordship of Jesus. Interesting thoughts there. Uh, I, they are presenting the idea that the saying, uh, everything is lawful for me, not uh, all things are expedient or beneficial. It, it, they're, they're saying that that is a slogan that the Corinthians adopted and Paul is saying, is giving it back to them and, and making them understand uh, you know, how, how that applies. It's interesting. interesting. I wonder how they knew that. Maybe there's other letters or something from that time. And also, whenever somebody says the Lordship of Christ, it makes me cringe because that usually means something other than what it should mean contextually. Yeah. You know, uh, you know Jesus is my Lord uh, in that he is my God, and he's also my Lord in that uh, I, I hope that he will uh, take charge and direct my life and help me and guide me and so on. And I'm trying to surrender my will over to Jesus and the Holy Spirit and, uh, and, and uh, let allow the Holy Spirit to work on me and transform me. I don't object to Jesus being my Lord. I just object to the people teaching that if you don't surrender your life over to Jesus, you, you cannot get saved or or you can't keep your salvation if you if you if you don't do that. And uh, the yeah. Lord be that the Lord implies his divinity, which they don't usually focus on. And uh, I just don't like how they've contextually made that sound as if us that trust in Christ alone what he did and not our abilities to surrender our lives to the lordship of christ uh yeah. i i don't like what they've done with that because they take the focus off of of it. he is the lord and our behavior will never be a hundred percent in honor of that lordship and when we make yeah. salvation contingent upon our obedience to his commands, it's just another way of adding the law to the gospel uh, now, uh, I, I think the remaining verses, we could go through a little more quickly so we can finish the chapter, but I don't want to push it beyond the time that you, you're too late for you in the East Coast. So let me know, Renee or, or uh, Cripps, uh, if you want to start finishing stuff now or try to take uh, 10 or 15 minutes to go through these last verses. Um, I don't want to hold everyone else back, but I cannot stay late tonight, unfortunately. Okay. Um, all right. Um I think that uh, I'd like to talk just about verse 18 together, 18 and 19 for just a second, and then and then we'll finish it up. And uh, we, we won't finish the whole chapter, but we can, uh, uh, that's all right. The chapter divisions weren't there in the originals, were they? So verse 18 and 19 uh, uh, in the, um, oh no, what are we on? Uh, not 18, 19. Um, 
I'm sorry. Uh, verse 15 and 16 and 17. I'm going to read that together and discuss that. 15, 16, 17. No, uh, this is in the KJV. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of a harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to a harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Uh, this verse, these verses here had a great impact on me many years ago when I first got saved. I've talked about it in my testimony about my marriage and relationship and the, the difficult periods uh, I had. Uh, my wife and I were uh, not, didn't get a long time, we're not happy, and I wasn't a Christian, so I felt perfectly justified in, in uh, having girlfriends and, and, and committing adultery. It didn't bother me in the least. You were married? Yeah, I was married. This was before I was uh, saved. and. Uh, uh, so, uh, I, I did that routinely and, um, thought it was okay. I thought, um, if I, if I'm not having this relationship in my, with my wife and I'm, I'll, I'll do what I have to do. And, and, uh, when I became a Christian and, and then, and read, started reading the Bible and particularly got to this point here, I was just crushed and I, um, I've never done anything like that since, but, uh, because the thought of me um, fornicating or having adultery, and, and I realized then that the Holy Spirit of God is inside me. Whatever I do, the Holy Spirit is doing right along with me. And that thought just blew me away and just was such a, 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 a shock to me that uh, I, I could never even consider that again. Yeah, Brother Lou. Yeah. Uh, the, the, I think it's so important because we see the uh, marriage and physical unity of two becoming one flesh. Is, and, and what's so bad is that sexuality has gotten to be perverted and sick in people's minds, so this might offend people. But it is a picture of the oneness we have in Christ. And uh, that's why it is such an abomination to go outside of that covenant relationship physically with someone because the fear, the, the, the physical bond of husband and wife uh, parallels the spiritual bond of Jesus and us and his church. And so when that is defiled, it defiles the picture of our oneness with Jesus. And so um, that's when, when it says, you know, uh, when you sin, you, you you join you're joining to a harlot. It's one body, and we are the body of Christ spiritually. And when you are with one person in body, and then you go outside and you join it to a harlot who's joined with many bodies, it makes it it defiles the picture of the love and intimacy and loyalty Jesus has for us. The whole Song of Solomon their love, their romantic love of falling in love, the, 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 the description of the passion that he has for her and vice versa is all a shadow of the passionate love God has for us. And when we were saved, we became one body with him. So it really defiles the whole picture of, of that like very holy, special relationship. And people don't understand that they think oh it's just sexuality it's nothing it's very serious because it, it is every sin a man doeth is without out the body but he that committed fornication sinned against his own body and that that's hardcore and a lot of people would say like well when you get drunk don't you sin against your own body you're taking no you're not getting it sinning against his own body is because you're one flesh it's not just you body anymore just like it's not just me in the body, it's Christ, myself, and his other beloved. We are one body, so we sin. That's a picture of sinning against and dividing that body. And so I, I think there's some heavy spiritual connotation to the 
joining of one flesh between a covenant bond of wife and husband. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, I, I don't think there's any need to read it in the Amplified. The, the KJV was quite clear, Brother Cripps. Uh, give us your thoughts on uh, 15, 16, 17. Uh, sure. So um, God hath both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up. And this is, this is what uh, he said in the verse uh, before, making the same point. Um, so, again, we're being conformed to the likeness of Christ. So our bodies are members of uh, Christ, shall then take the members of Christ and make them members uh, like with a harlot, for instance, God forbid. Um, I like what you said, Brother Luke, and I had similar thoughts of thinking about um, uh, things that I did in my past uh, and those... Uh, the idea of being one flesh and certainly didn't didn't want that to be true. Um, fortunately, God does forgive and doesn't hold that uh, against us. But it, it's it's definitely scary enough to not uh, repeat the same behavior. Um, I, I agree with that 100. Uh, but but he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. I love this, especially for a marriage. So a marriage should be, we were talking about this on Monday's Milk, the idea of uh, two people becoming one flesh and having God in the center um, and putting him first. Each each of them has an individual relationship with God. Uh, it's such a beautiful picture. And it's the same thing that we have with him. We have his spirit in us. We have his spirit in us. Um, so we're one with him, uh, which is wonderful. And it's only by his grace and mercy that that's uh, allowed to even happen, especially while we're still carrying the flesh around. But that picture, Brother Luke, that you brought up, I, I've done that very same thing um, after the fact and thinking about that everything that I did uh, from the point of being a believer, every, every uh, bad thing that I did, it's like dragging the Holy Spirit along with you. Um, and for me, that was, that was uh, deterrent from continuing to do that once I really had that understanding. Uh, it's been helpful. So thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah. All right. Uh, then uh, uh, because of time, we'll stop here. Uh, Brother Cripps, so you don't have to stay longer than necessary. Let, let me ask you to sum up your thoughts first tonight. Yeah. Uh, I think the biggest thing I want, thank you, Brother Luke. The biggest thing I want to walk away with here is don't cherry pick scripture because he's making the, Paul's making this very, very clear who he's talking about here. And it's so important to understand that he, he, in referring to the revelers and the, all that stuff, um, that he's, that he's talking about those people that are, aren't washed. They're not sanctified. They're, uh, they're of the world. And, um, I'm so tired of people just taking scriptures out of context and using it to prop up their false doctrine and and to get people into this place of of fear and doubt and um you know when they when they slip up or they sin or or to try to say that if you drink alcohol then you're going to hell i mean it's just on and on and on it goes um yes the, paul also makes very clear that we're not to we're not to uh have anything in control of us so everything is okay for us to do doesn't mean it's good for us, but it's okay. It's lawful to do that as a believer. Uh, but let's use some some God sense. Um, let's use some spirit sense. <laughs> Since the common sense isn't common anymore, we can use his Holy Spirit to, um, to help us pummel that flesh into submission and uh, go by what the Holy Spirit and, and keep that concept in mind because that, that really, really works to know that anything that you're doing the Holy Spirit is is with you if you're if you're a, uh, a saint. Um, that Spirit is in you, and you don't want to uh, do things that would be uh, displeasing to Him. And if you have that in mind, it 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 can be a deterrent. It can help you uh, keep the flesh in check. And um, thanks, guys, uh, for letting me be a part of this as usual. And good night to the chat. Thank you. All right, brother. Good night. Good night. Sister Renee, uh, you miss you already, Crip. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, the, this chapter I love because I was so happy to see that. I've never heard anyone in a commentary or footnote refer to that unrighteous as unbelievers, and I'm so glad somebody finally did put it in context. 
because this whole chapter, that little section of verses of these are the unrighteous, this is what they do. They are the unjust unbelievers that you insist on taking your court cases against each other before. And you shouldn't be suing each other, but not only you're suing each other, you're taking them before the unrighteous unbelievers. And they extort and lie and live like crazy people. And you're trusting them to judge cases when the least esteemed among you should be able to judge it because you're going to judge angels one day. You will inherit the kingdom, but they will not. It is the same context of saying uh, the sinless later and says, and they which do such things will not inherit. It's the same ones. It's the same unrighteous, unjust unbelievers that he refers to here clearly. Uh, I also like how he uh, deals with the flesh and how the flesh actually can affect our spirit. Uh, but there are some things that are just flesh. They have nothing to do with spiritual matters at all. Belly for the meats, meats for the belly, both perish. There's nothing to do with the spiritual at all. And those of the flesh, mind things of the flesh. So those that are legalistic, that aren't dealing with the Holy Spirit, they're going to pay attention to these uh, self-righteous, fleshly righteous things like abstaining from meats and, and stuff like that. And they're going to think it makes them righteous. If you look at false religions like Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, they all abstain, even Catholicism, abstain from certain foods as an order of righteousness to be in good standing or pleasing to God. Uh, and they think that what they're doing in the flesh is pleasing God. And it's not. Those in the flesh can't please God. It's not possible. Uh, so I, I'm glad that he's dividing here that some of these things, they were they were wise and needful at the time, like to set Israel apart and holy for the Savior to be born through. But these things are not what justify us in the sight of God at all. These fleshly things don't. And uh, I think it's it's good. I want to remind everybody. It says, "Blessed is the man who does not condemn that which he allows." So if something is not stated as sinful, and you do it, and it's not sin, but then somebody convinces you it is sin, and you do it anyway, now it is sin to you, because whatsoever is not a faith is sin. And if you do it against your own conscience, now you're drinking or eating condemnation to yourself or damnation to yourself. Uh, it's not eternal damnation, obviously, but that's why he talks about it in the other chapter. Are you gonna you're gonna allow your brother to perish uh, or be destroyed because you insist on your liberty of eating what you want when the weaker brother is not so secure in his freedom? You know, just bear it for his his sake. It's the same thing here. I love this chapter. I'm so glad we we spent the time on it. I'm so happy to see you guys. Yeah. Yeah, and of course the remaining verses in this chapter are really profound, and we'll get to that next time. But uh, I, I hope everybody enjoyed the study tonight. I will address one thing I noticed in the chat room uh, asking about the Amplified and its and its uh, kind of uh, genealogy of manuscripts where it came from. I'm I'm aware of that, and uh, what my position, and I, I think that Renee and Cripps have uh, have agreed that this is good is that um, we use the KJV first, we rely on the KJV as the truth and the word and the scriptures, and then we, we find that if we look at other translations, I like the Amplified and the NABRE, particularly for the footnotes, uh, that's, it, it can sometimes be helpful to us. Um, we're not KJV onlyist in that we, uh, we want to look at other things if it can be helpful, but we compare it to the KJV and test it against the KJV is because that's the one that we trust. <clears throat> so uh, uh, thanks for pointing that out, but it's, it's nothing I wasn't aware of as far as the uh, kind of the manuscript. Of, uh, I don't know. The, I don't know what the proper word is, the, the, the lineage of, of manuscripts that uh, it, it came from. All the modern tran uh, uh, translations are coming from that uh, same uh, manuscript uh, and the uh, the KJV is uh, is different, and um, it has the thing about the KJV that is most important to me is it has all the verses. Uh, there's a lot of verses in the KJV that are removed or footnoted. Uh, they're being challenged that um, we don't think that this verse was in the original. 
We think that this was inserted by a scribe. So because um, because the modern translations do that, I uh, I don't trust them the way I do the KJV. I want all the scriptures, uh, not just you know some of the most important ones like First Timothy three sixteen. There are three that bear record in heaven: the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. This is the Trinity verse of the Bible. First uh, John five seven, which is um, God was manifest in the flesh. This is telling us that God Himself was made flesh. That's Jesus. He's God. Other translations word it that uh, uh, He was manifest in the flesh, or Jesus was manifest in the flesh. It's not the same thing as saying God was manifest in the flesh. There's many other examples I could give you, but for that reason, uh, the, the KJV is the one that I'm trusting. Uh, all right. Um, so I guess the last thing I'll say is um, thanks to everybody in the chat room, especially to the, um, um, the moderators for what you do. And uh, look forward to next time. Uh, oh, I forgot. You didn't get the first part of the program that was directed to Ma Matthias's program ac channel accidentally. So let me ask you to pray for Brother Anthony. He had to be rushed to the emergency room tonight. He had quadruple bypass surgery recently and he's still having issues. And also to pray for my friend uh, Don's, uh, Don Walker for his uh, daughter, Tracy, who needs a, a new liver. And also pray for Brother Cripps, who's having a particular problem today that he needs help with. So thank you, everybody. And uh, join us Friday for Fellowship Friday, 930 Eastern Time. And don't forget tomorrow night, Sister Renee is kicking off her new program, uh, Thursday Throwdown, I think is what it's called. And I I think she's going to have Sister Lisa on, uh, who, who her channel is yeah. For the Most High Jesus. Yeah, I haven't confirmed and So, uh, Yeah, I hope she's available. That would be great for the two of you to do that. So I'm looking forward to Renee's new program every Thursday night. Okay, thank you all. And bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.